So those of you who don't know me probably don't know me. So I'm not going to be standing up. I'm here in my little wheelchair and my little hands are paralyzed. I'm a C7 quadriplegic. That's just my life. It's been my life for the past almost 19 years. It'll be 19 years on March 6th. So I was paralyzed when I was hiking and I accidentally jumped up a cliff. And now that's what I am and that's what I have. And I really have been taking messages from President Nelson very seriously. And, you know, he was talking in April 2022 about, you know, expect miracles, you know, and seek and expect miracles. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, I know not just me, but all of us are seeking and expecting miracles. I was, I was, I've really been thinking about that story in the, in the Bible where Jesus is teaching in a home and it's, it has, it's packed, like tons of people there. And for all of you listening at home, who are in a wheelchair or who know someone in a wheelchair or have someone in a wheelchair, crowds are hard. They're particularly hard. They're hard for anybody who has any sort of physical disabilities because everyone is nice to people with physical disabilities until they want to be where you are. And then it, it makes it makes crowds, you know, particularly difficult. And even even church crowds can get, you know, really, really difficult. And so here's a bunch of people listening to Jesus speak in the house and these Guys come up with their friend who's paralyzed and they want him to see Jesus because they know about the miracles that Jesus brings. And so they're getting there, but they can't get through the press. They can't get through the crowds with their friend. And I, I definitely understand what they are meaning when they say that because, you know, crowds are really particularly difficult. And so they go and they climb on the roof and they lower their friend to the roof. And, and, you know, that we've had some, some messages on that recently in general conference where, Jesus Christ probably heard the scratching and he was looking up and, you know, seeing parts of the roof, you know, maybe fall onto the floor, maybe get on his clothes, you know, you know, brushing them off a little bit. And they lower this man who's paralyzed on a bed through the ceiling, you know, they're lowering him down and, you know, like heal him, fix him. We have climbed this house. We have lowered him down. We brought ropes and we've done this and here he is, fix him. And what does Jesus do? But he looks at him and says, I forgive your sins. And then, of course, we know the story where there's people in the crowd who are like, oh, you know, this guy can't forgive sins, you know. And then Jesus looks at them and he's like, why speak ye evil? Why think ye evil in your hearts? And so you know that I do have power to forgive sins. I'm going to look at this guy and say, okay, arise, take up your bed and walk. And then he heals him. And I would like to say, as a person who is paralyzed in this life, that Jesus healed the more disabling disability first. There is something very hard in this life when we are sinning. And when we talk about sinning, this is not, I'm not going to be speaking on repentance, kind of, but I kind of am. Because sometimes we think of sinning as like something we need to do when we've done something major that's, you know, outside the commandments. Oh my goodness. But really anything that goes against what Heavenly Father wants for us could be considered that way. And when we align our will with his, we find a freedom and an ability well beyond our physical abilities that we currently have now. I want to share with you, I want to share a picture. Mark, do you have that picture for me? This is hanging on a wall that I have in my living room. This is a picture of a Native American counting coup, and in the, with the Plains Native Americans, they this was a this was an act, this was a warrior, and it was an act of bravery that he would do, which would be to come up to his enemy, and he would, you know, he has like a he has a stick in this picture, and that's what they would do. They would touch their enemy with this stick, and then they would go back and they would tell everybody, "I got you know this close to my enemy, and I didn't kill him." I didn't kill my enemy. I just touched him. I extended peace during this time. This particular picture I got from my parents. So above it is a, is a star. It's the Vietnamese flag. It has soldier footprints on it. My dad took it off. A soldier who was lying on the ground, you know, in the time of war during Vietnam. So I have quite a few pictures on this wall that are very meaningful to me and my family that show a lot of things from my family. And this particular picture was painted, it's watercolor, by my dad's first wife's sister-in-law. So his ex-sister-in-law that he, that he had with his first wife, and he came home from being eight months away at war, and his wife was six months pregnant. So that was, that was troubling. But in the divorce settlement, he got this painting that he loved very much. 
And the divorce lawyer's secretary was my mom. So that's how they got married, or that's how they met. And then they got married in El Paso, Texas. And I want to share that they were married and they had a long and happy, beautiful marriage for a long time. And they they had four kids, my sister and me, and I have two little brothers. And then, you know, time went on and things got hard. And that whole bit about enduring to the end really was a lot of enduring. And it was just a little bit difficult for them. And there was some problem. And my parents decided to separate. And this was when I was, I don't know, it was about five years ago, six years ago. And so they separated. And that was particularly her. And I seemed to be the only, I was like the only one who was surprised by this. And so I, I had a particularly hard time when they separated. And the, they didn't get divorced right away. Of course, they just separated. They moved into two different homes. And they did ultimately get divorced, but for a while they were just separated. And I had a holiday gathering at my house. And I say holiday gathering because I honestly cannot remember if it was Christmas or if it was Thanksgiving. I kind of think it was Thanksgiving, but it might have been Christmas. I don't remember, honestly. But it was a holiday gathering that I held it at my house now because my parents weren't going to hold it at one of their houses, just in my house. And ever since then, all the holiday gatherings, with no matter when they are, have been at my house, and I'm happy. I'm happy to be that person. But this very first holiday gathering, I saw everyone kind of getting out of their cars. They all sort of arrived at the same time and started coming in. And all of a sudden, it got to be too much for me. And I ran, I mean, rolled into the bathroom and I locked the door and I just, you know, locked myself in the bathroom because I, I wasn't sure if I could be in the same room as my mom and my dad because they were not getting along at this time. They were not getting along at all. And my siblings had, were taking sides and my in-laws were taking sides and so-and-so was angry at so-and-so who was angry at so-and-so who was angry at so-and-so and there was just so much anger going on. And I got into the bathroom and I prayed and I said, Heavenly Father, I hate them all. Like, I can't go out there. I can't go out there and be nice to anybody. Like, I just can't do it. I can't muster those feelings right now. This is too hard. And I prayed and I was praying and I was like, but I can fake it. I can fake it. I can fake those feelings. I can go out. I can say the right thing and I can do the right thing. And I thought of that picture about the Native American counting coup. That's what it's called. I don't know if I said that. I thought about the Native American counting coup and extending peace to his enemy in a time of war. And I thought, I can do that. I can do that. And so I went out to this holiday gathering and I smiled and I faked it and I faked being happy and I faked, you know, good feelings at the, that holiday gathering. And for a lot of events and phone calls and texts after that. And then after some time, I think it was maybe a couple of years, I started to recognize that I wasn't faking it anymore. That even though so and so might have still been mad at so and so, who was still mad at so and so, who was still mad at so and so, I had love for everybody. And it didn't start out as love at first, it started out as the correct action at first. And I'm all about he healthy boundaries and I'm all about, you know, not putting yourself in a dangerous situation. You definitely shouldn't be doing that. I'm not saying to do that. But I am saying that we can be with family during the holidays who maybe we don't agree with, who, whose opinions differ from ours, whose way of raising children is different from ours, whose, uh, you know, thoughts politically or on, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever are different from ours. I think that we can put those feelings aside and we can do the right things and show love even if we don't feel it. And if we show it, I think soon those feelings of love will come to all of us. In Matthew 5, 22, in fact, <laughs> just this last weekend, we were laughing all the way and Mark handed me something and he said, here, sign this. And the person wants to know your favorite scripture. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Hank always puts a favorite scripture on stuff and John has a favorite scripture. And I mean, I like the scriptures. I, I, you know, I read them. But I'm not sure if I can come up with a favorite scripture and so I've got Matthew 5, 22. And Matthew 5, 22 is like, when I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whoso shall say to his brother or rotna 
shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And this particular chapter is pretty meaningful for me. So I, I'm not sure, I'm sure that person at home, they're like, oh my gosh, this person's not very spiritual at all. <laughs> and so, but I use this, this scripture because it talks about when we're angry with other people, they can put us into prison. That's what it talks about, that we get put into prison. And, you know, who can pay one C9 while they're in prison? Like nobody, everything goes to the warden. And when you're, you know, when you're working in prison, but if we don't show anger, if we forgive others and if we treat them with respect, that's what I talk about with my, I've got three daughters, but two of them can talk and two of them can talk a lot and share their opinions and they are not the same. And so we talk a lot about respect, how, yes, this person's different. You know, your sister's different. Well, she's not going to think the same as you and it's only going to get worse. And so we need to show respect to her and her opinions and just show her love. We, there are no commandments. There are no commandments in the entire history of commandment giving. There are no commandments that command us to make sure that we make sure someone else keeps commandments. We're supposed to teach our children. We're supposed to show them the right way. And we're supposed to be good examples of keeping the commandments ourselves. But we're under no obligation to make sure someone else keeps commandments. They're, they're in charge of their own salvation and we're in charge of ours. And when we keep the commandments, we need to make sure that we keep that most important commandment to love Heavenly Father, but also to love our neighbors. And our neighbor includes our family. And sometimes those are the harder ones to love. President Nelson came out and this is, this was so important for me. It's that, it's that quote, Mark, maybe we could pull that up. None of us can control nations or the actions of others, or even members of our own families. Isn't that the truth? But we can control ourselves. This is President Nelson. He said, my call today, dear brothers and sisters, is to end conflicts that are raging in your hearts, your home, and your life. Bury any and all inclination to hurt others, whether those inclinations be a temper, a sharp tongue, or a resentment. Sometimes those are the worst, those resentments when someone else has hurt us for someone who has hurt you. The Savior commanded us to turn the other cheek to love our enemies and to pray for those who despitefully use us. It can be painfully difficult to let go of anger that feels so justified. This is that next slide, Mark. It can seem impossible to forgive those whose destructive actions have hurt the innocent. And yet the Savior admonished us to forgive all men. We are followers of the Prince of Peace now more than ever. We need the peace only he can bring. We can, how can we expect peace to exist in the world when we are not individually seeking peace and harmony? Brothers and sisters, I know that I'm what I'm suggesting is not easy, but followers of Jesus Christ should set the example for all the world to follow. I plead with you to do all you can to end personal conflicts that are currently raging in your hearts. And in your lives. My, my freedom that I have is very real and it's very enjoyable. I, I recognize that there are lots of people that I know well who don't have the freedom that I enjoy. I might not be able to walk, but I have abilities that come because I choose to forgive and I choose to not worry about other people. You know, I set the example by keeping the commandments myself, but I'm not worried about other people repenting. They can repent and they can seek forgiveness. And me forgiving them doesn't mean the Savior does. And I'm not in control of that. Me forgiving someone else doesn't mean I open the gates of heaven for them. I'm not that important. Me forgiving them only sets a prisoner free. And I've discovered that that prisoner is myself. When they lowered the paralyzed man to Jesus Christ, those people were probably very disappointed when he said to them, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure they were like, that is not why we lowered him to you. We, we were expecting something a little bit more miraculous. But Jesus Christ was identifying the bigger disability and helping him overcome something very severe. I don't know what his sins were, but maybe they included being angry at his sister-in-law. Maybe they included being grumpy with his mom. I don't know. Maybe family had nothing to do with that. But if family has something to do with 
with the grumpiness and anger that maybe people live, sitting at home watching this feel, I would invite you also to maybe put that aside and don't put yourself in, you know, in a place when, where it's harmful. Never, never do that. You know, we need to have safe boundaries. But as far as loving, loving other people, we can choose to do that and act on President Nelson's call to end those personal conflicts in our lives and have a very peaceful life for ourselves and discover an ability well beyond our physical ability when we, when we forgive others and seek forgiveness for ourselves. And I hope that you can enjoy that this Christmas as you love others and let them love you too. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, who will come when we are being peaceful. Amen.